Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to this hour of worship here through Oakhurst United Methodist Church. My name is Tim Ehrlich. I'm co-pastor here today <laughs> for one more day uh, at Oakhurst together with Pastor Nathan Carlson. Yes, today is my very last day as pastor at Oakhurst, my very last Sunday, and uh, don't have a lot of announcements for the day. The only thing I really have is just, again, to thank everyone for the wonderful years of ministry that I've had here at Oakhurst. Um, two out of 16 ain't bad. I'm just, it's been great the whole time. I've really enjoyed being here and been blessed to be your pastor. So thank you. Let's join together now in worship. Good morning, Oakhurst family. Please join me now in the prayer of the people. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and begin with glory and praise to you, dear Jesus, for you are our strength, our joy, and our comfort. Thank you for how we experience your presence in the Trinity and how you show us the way north even when fears attack and uncertainties come. We bow our heads in acknowledgement of your guidance, your shelter, and your comforting touch. Thank you for your presence is always with us, Father. And all you ask is that we call out to you, dear Lord. We also come to you this morning with a mix of feelings of joy and celebration, as well as some sadness and a flood of memories, as our beloved Pastor Tim shares with us his farewell sermon. We look to Paul in the book of Acts as he says farewell to his church with the apostles. Paul is compelled by the Holy Spirit to move on, and he declares, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing. He goes on to say, my only aim is to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. We thank you, Father, for the leadership you've afforded us in Pastor Tim and how he has embodied Paul's very message to the church. We thank you for the many ways that Pastor Tim has modeled for us these farewell words and how he has taught us to be shepherds of your church, bought with your own blood. We also thank you for bestowing us with the inspired and inspiring leadership in Pastor Nathan as we too move forward in faith, service, and love for you and your church. Thank you again for how you have richly blessed us and this church in the precious years past and the exciting years moving forward. May we serve you always. Please join me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we have forgiven those who trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's join together for today's pastoral prayer. Almighty God, we come before you today and we give you thanks and praise for the ministry of Pastor Tim here among us these last 16 years. And as he celebrates this last day with us and he shares the insights that he's accumulated over this lifetime journey and service and ministry, Lord, open up our hearts, open up our minds, open up our ears to hear what he has to offer to us today. For we know that you have filled him with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this time when we get to worship together. You have given us all of these gifts and all of these talents and all of these insights into your word and into your will so that we might use them together to build up your kingdom. So Lord, we ask that you continue your kingdom's work in and through us as we approach this time of receiving the message and as we continue in praise together today, Lord. We know that our hearts are saddled and burdened with heavy worries, with thoughts of guilt, with shame, with, with thoughts and worries about illnesses. Lord, we today ask that during this time of worship, that you be with us in the midst of all of this, that you would calm our anxieties and fears, that you would assure us of your grace, and that we would know your healing work in our lives. And so we pray and ask all of this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. time for this morning's sermon and I want to invite you to bow your heads and pray along silently with me as I pray out loud. Let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for the awesome privilege and responsibility of sharing your word with your congregation this morning. I pray, Lord, that all that I say and all that we hear would be acceptable in your sight for you are our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Thank you, Lord. So my first pastoral appointment was to two little churches that I served both at the same time in the Catskill Mountains in Olive Bridge and Samsonville. And the Catskill Mountains, upstate New York, was pretty cold. Um, one of the members of my congregation told me one time, we have eight months of winter here and four months of bad sledding. And for me, being a person that loves to be outdoors and being athletic and doing things, the best thing for me was that there was a ski center, the Bel Air Mountain Ski Center, a New York State owned and operated ski mountain that was only 30 miles from the parsonage. And Bel Air 
had this really terrific uh, plan that uh, I took advantage of. Unlimited skiing during the weekdays throughout the entire season for $100. And as my day off has always been Monday, I took advantage of that. And every opportunity I could on a Monday, I was out there skiing. And by the time I had got done with my second year out there, those long winters, I got to be a very, very good skier. I could handle the most challenging expert slope without much difficulty. And I'll never forget one time skiing off the chairlift at the top of the mountain and skiing over to the edge of the most challenging, uh, the most challenging slope or run uh, at Bel Air Mountain. It's a double diamond, black diamond, expert slope. Very, very steep. And I looked down at that thing. It looked more like a cliff with snow on it. And I remember looking down that and thinking, man, I'm going to ski down that. Holy cow. But experience had told me that I could do that and that it would be uh, thrilling and challenging and an awesome amount of fun. I didn't have a plan exactly how I was going to get down that slope. I just knew that I could do it. And so I pushed off the edge and down I went. Well, right now, I mentioned that because right now, both Pastor Nathan and I are kind of at the top of a double diamond expert slope. And we're looking down at this huge drop and we're just amazed at what's in front of us. Fortunately, both Nathan and I are expert pastors and we have uh, many years of experience and we are both good Christians. And so from previous experience, we know that we're going to be able to ski down that very imposing looking slope that is in front of us. And more than that, it's going to be challenging and exciting and really awesome. Uh, but we've learned over the years that if we put ourselves in God's hands and trust in God, God is always going to come through for us. Now, for me, the slope is giving up being a pastor uh, after 37 years of doing that job. You know, I've uh, committed my life to serving God as a teenager, and now I need to find a new outlet for that service. For Nathan, the double diamond expert slope that he's looking down at is shouldering the full weight of being senior pastor of a fairly large church like Oakhurst is. Uh, you know, Oakhurst is a fairly large church. And over the last two years, we've been transitioning uh, from me being senior pastor to Nathan being able to take over that job as senior pastor. But during that time, he and I have pretty much equally shared the burden uh, of the leadership of the church. Um, in the past, now Nathan and I, every time Nathan and I have come to a conclusion about the course of the of the direction of the church, a thing that we wanted to do. Um, sometimes Nathan had his own ideas. And there was always, every time you make a big decision that affects a lot of people, there's always uh, the question of somebody might be mad. And I always told Nathan, well, look, Nathan, you can always blame it on me because, you know, I'm out of here in a short period of time, but that's not going to work for too much longer. Although I understand I can continue to be blamed for at least a year afterwards, uh, whatever <laughs> goes on. The Apostle Paul talked about, and there, this is a serious thing, truly, the burden of being a leader in the church. He spoke about it in his second letter to the Corinthians. Uh, after talking about the difficulties that he had in ministry, let me just share this with you. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes, I've worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights, I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then beside all this, I have the daily burden, and here it is, the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and without my feeling weakness? Who is led astray and I do not burn with anger? So Paul writes about the daily burden of the church. And believe me, pastors feel that burden. 
It is a wait. Every time we open our email folder, every time we attend a committee meeting, every time a member becomes sick, every time a member has a calamity in their lives, um, we feel the weight of uh, carrying this burden of concern, compassion, love for the congregation. As the Apostle Paul said, who is weak without my feeling weakness? Now that very empathy, which helps us to be good pastors, caring and concerned pastors, also opens us up to sharing the pains and the sufferings that our congregation go through. It takes a person with very strong faith, a thick skin, and a supportive clergy family just to survive in a whole ministry career. But what it takes to thrive is a partnership with the congregation. Both Peter and Paul uh, said to us that we as Christians are in partnership with God. We are in partnership with Christ. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians. God has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And to the Hebrews, he wrote, and so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus. In his first letter, the Apostle Peter wrote this, You are a chosen people, royal priests, God's own possession. Now, what all this means is that as members of Oakhurst Church, as a congregation, the best thing that you can do for this church and truly for yourself is to accept God's offer of partnership with you and to devote your best efforts to fill your role as part of the priesthood of believers uh, in helping to move the kingdom of God forward through Oakhurst United Methodist. And that also means to help Oakhurst uh, to grow. And that means to be in partnership with Nathan, Pastor Nathan. Within the next two years, Oakhurst is going to face three big challenges. The first is that the denomination is going to be changing. And we don't know if that's going to be a little blip on the screen or a big deal yet, because we don't know exactly how that's going to play out. But there's this controversy that's going on, and there's going to be a final resolution about the question of ordaining gay people to be pastors and performing marriage ceremonies for gay couples. Um, and uh, that is definitely going to happen. We don't know what the results are going to be, but it's, it's a challenge that's out there. The second major challenge that's facing our congregation is one that's facing congregations across the United States. Demographics are changing. Uh, Pastor Nathan mentioned this in a sermon uh, a week or two ago, but um, we have now, in America, we have now for the first time Across the threshold where less than 50% of Americans belong to a church. And what that means is that across the board, people see church as less important than they did in the past. And truly, the survival of the church is going to depend on whether or not we can bring new people into the church going forward. And so that's going to be a major challenge. And the third challenge that I see facing Oakhurst is complacency. Um, we like this church. We're comfortable with how church is. But just because church is meeting our needs doesn't mean that it's healthy. The reality is that good enough is truly the enemy of excellent. Um, being satisfied with where we are can be the enemy of being a healthy church. Now, as for me, you may have heard about this, you may have experienced this. I know a few folks that fall into this category. I read a discouraging report last week from the Harvard Medical School that said, retirement increases a man's risk of dying of a heart attack. A study found that there's an 80% higher rate of death from coronary disease among those in their study who had retired compared with those who had not. Fortunately for me, there is no retiring from serving God. Uh, but I recognize that there are seasons in a person's life. And those seasons affect what kind of service we are able to do. 
I'm planning on continuing to do as much as I can, as long as I can, as fast as I can, and as well as I can. But my challenge is I don't know what form that's going to take just yet. You probably know this, but uh, the word in Greek that we translate as minister is diakonos. And it also is translated as servant. A minister is truly a servant. Um, our Lord Jesus said this, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those uh, under them. But among you, it must be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. And I can tell you that you're lucky because there are not many pastors out there that have that same servant heart that Pastor Nathan and I do. It takes a certain mentality and a certain personality to be willing to put in the kind of hours and uh, to serve even almost like a slave. Uh, a friend of mine kidded around one time with me and he said, remember, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, but he didn't free you. <laughs> well, Pastor Nathan, I can tell you, and I don't quit when we hit 40 hours a week, nor do we get overtime pay. We do what we do to serve God and to serve you. And we consider ourselves privileged for the opportunity to do so. Now, all of us together need to continually work on the partnership relationship between the congregation and the pastor. One time I did a funeral off campus somewhere. It was in the summertime and when I got done with the funeral, it was hot. I took my robe off and I threw it in the back seat of the car and I forgot about it. And Sunday morning I was looking for my robe and I remembered, oh gosh, it's in the car. And I dug it out and put it on and it was wrinkled. Now someone anonymously complained to the staff parish relations uh, committee that I wore a wrinkled robe to church. Now the right way to handle that situation would have been to realize I only have one white robe and maybe that person who was offended by this could have taken the initiative to help me get a second uh, robe or even just to speak to me and find out what happened. Um, as your senior pastor, Nathan doesn't need 400 bosses uh, telling him what his flaws are, and what things he's done wrong. Um, what Pastor Nathan needs is not supervision. I can tell you that as his, uh, as his boss for the last five years, Nathan doesn't need supervision. He's a self-starter. He knows what needs to be done, and he does it. What Pastor Nathan really needs from you is he needs a true partner in ministry. He needs someone who is thinking all the time about how things can be better. How can we better accomplish the mission of reaching people with Jesus Christ? So he needs people thinking about it. And more than that, he needs people who are willing to put their shoulder to the wheel and to do the work together with Nathan. So what I'm saying to you is this. Don't come to Pastor Nathan with concerns about the way one thing or another is going in the church. Instead, come to him with ideas about how to fix an issue that you see and a willingness to do whatever you can do to help fix it. There's an old saying you may have heard, transitions begin with an end and end with the beginning. In this beginning, for Pastor Nathan and for Oakhurst Church, um, you know, we know that there are challenges ahead, and I mentioned a couple of those. But as we look towards the future for Oakhurst, I see four possibilities. It's like we've come to a crossroads. And at that crossroads, like a four-way stop sign, um, we have a choice to make as a congregation. We can go forward and grow. We can try to stay as we are. We can decline or we can merge with another larger congregation. 
Now, as I see it, I don't believe that this congregation wants to stay the same, wants to decline, or wants to merge. But what that means is we need to be a healthy church because a healthy church is a growing church. Um, we need to be a healthy church. And if Oakhurst is going to be a healthy church, then it's going to take all of us to pull together. It's going to take all of us praying for growth, inviting our neighbors, inviting our relatives and friends who live in the area. And it's going to take all of us to be welcoming here at church in our worship services and Sunday school classes and our service opportunities. Um, every time we are here, we need to be welcoming. Now, here's a funny story. When I was going from my church in central New York to the churches that I served in Pennsylvania, I sent the bulletin ahead to the church secretary of the new church that I was about to start uh, for the week, the first week that I was there. But I made a mistake and I accidentally sent her the bulletin from my last Sunday at the last church and the sermon title that was printed in the bulletin for that Sunday in my new church was looking back at my years of ministry with you. And I realized that I had accidentally stumbled on a great way to share my vision for the new church. So I preached the sermon based on what it was going to look like when I was leaving the church to go to another assignment years in the future. Now, I thought that was such a good idea that when I got to Oakhurst, I did the same thing on my first Sunday. I preached a sermon as if I was looking back. And now I am looking back. And uh, it's a different feeling. Uh, I was saying to a couple of folks just today, you know, as a pastor, every day when I go to work, I'm making a difference in somebody's life. Every day, I'm doing something that is meaningful for the life of this church, for the life of the body of Christ. And then when you retire, that's a big hole to fill. How are you going to make a difference? And that's what I'm going to be working on. Now, you all have a scripture quotes and notes sheet in your bulletin. And I want you to take a look at the reading from uh, Acts chapter 20. Now, what this is, is Paul's goodbye speech to the church at Ephesus. And Paul writes, um, or Paul says, You know that from the day that I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I've endured the trials that came uh, to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I've had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I'm bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing uh, to me unless I use it for finishing the work that assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I declared today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault, for I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. Remember the years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you, night and day, and my many tears for you. And now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. And you know, that passage um, has some parallels in my ministry as well. From the day I set foot in this church, I've tried to do the Lord's work humbly. I tried to never ever shrink back from telling you what you needed to hear. I've always preached the importance of repenting from sin 
in turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. And like Paul, I don't know what awaits me, but the Holy Spirit tells me that my life is worth nothing unless I use it for finishing the work that has been assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news of Christ and spreading the kingdom of God on earth. Now, unlike Paul, I know that you're going to see me again. I'm not going away. I'm going to be a part of our church going forward as a member of the congregation. And I'm looking forward to my participation in that way. And in the meantime, I'm going to entrust you to God and the leadership of Pastor Nathan and the leaders of our church. And I'm going to pray that God blesses each one of you in this congregation with health, with uh, long life, with prosperity, with success, and of course, with faith and love. When Moses was giving his farewell speech to the people of Israel, he told them this. Now listen, today I'm giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and keep his commands decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you and the land you're about to enter and occupy. Now, in a very real sense, as I depart, I can give the same kind of message because the long-term life, health, and well-being of Oakhurst Church is in your hands. It is your choice as a congregation. And I hope and pray and trust that you will choose the life and the prosperity of the church and that you're going to continue to love and obey God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And remember that the living word of God, the scriptures promise us that if we do choose the life and the prosperity for the church and our love and obedience to God, that both we and Oakhurst Church will be blessed and Oakhurst will multiply. And this is my prayer for your best wishes for you and for our congregation. And I thank you again for the awesome privilege of being able to be your pastor for the last 16 years. Thank you and may God bless you. We come to that time now where we get to share our gifts, tithes, and offerings for the work of mission and ministry together here at Oakhurst United Methodist Church. During this time, if you're worshiping with us online, 
you have a few options on how to share in this ministry with us. The first is that you can download our church app and click on the heart button at the bottom of the screen, and that'll take you directly to our giving portal. Or you can click on the giving portal link at the description of each of these videos. That'll take you to the giving portal on our website, or you can go to our website and just click the giving icon at the top of the screen. Or you can mail in a check to the church. However you choose to partner with us in this, we are grateful to partner with you because it's not just about financial contributions and the financial gifts that we give to the mission and ministry, the work of the kingdom, but it's also about our time and our talents. It's about our ideas and our energy. It's about our presence and our prayers. And we trust and know that you are offering all of these to God along with us during this time. And so we thank you for each of those areas in which you are contributing to making Oakhurst United Methodist Church a great uh, missional beacon to the community around us and around the world. And so we thank you for all of that as well. At this time, let's join together in prayer for all that is being given. Almighty God, we know that you entrust us with so many gifts and graces of time and treasure and talent of ideas and energy. Lord, we come before you today and we would ask that you use all of who we are and all of what we have for your purposes, that each moment of each day would see us contributing to building your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So we ask today that you bless these gifts and those who give them, but not just these financial gifts, all of the gifts and all of the ways that we contribute to building up your kingdom. Bless our witness, bless our hands and our feet. Lord, we ask this in your holy name. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as one ministry comes to an end and another ministry begins, we thank you, Lord, for transitions in life. Milestones and mile markers are a reminder to us of the importance of devoting our lives to you. For we measure our success as Christians in the love that we leave behind us and the differences we make in people's lives. And so, Lord, we pray that we continue to make a difference in people's lives. We who are your chosen people, your royal priesthood, believers in your son Jesus, disciples, your children. We pray, Lord, that we would answer the great calling that you have given to us to be your partners in ministry here and in the world. Strengthen us for this task by blessing us with the Holy Spirit. Be in us, empower us, and guide us. 
Thank you, Lord. All this we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Before you go, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share this video across all of your social media platforms. Thank you for joining us in worship. We'll see you next time.